Here's an interesting one. The doctrine of election, right? Election. How unconditional exactly is election? Uh, now for those who are my Calvinist friends, who hopefully will still be friends later, the, the doctrine of election is in Calvinism, unconditional election. It's, it's one of, the, it's one of the, the letters of tulip. I think it's the U, probably. I'm just being silly. But yes, the, the unconditional election. Now I want to give you a confession. This topic is massive, and when you when you delve into these issues and you start hearing the debates and the discussions, it starts to get rather complicated, and it branches out really quickly. And you started talking about election, and pretty soon you're talking about what the difference between f libertarian free will and combat compatibilist free will, and and all sorts of weird, interesting concepts that just get a little bit too much sometimes. At least for one message, that's for sure. Um, so I myself am still trying to learn and get these topics. Um, but I do have positions on them, and I want to share those openly. And the goal here, my main goal is this. I want to affirm what Scripture says as true and then say, so what does that mean? That, that's the general approach we're going to have. Of course, everyone's going to say they do that. But, but that's, of course, my goal. Just affirm biblical truth, not pick a side and a, defend one side and attack the other. That's not really the goal. Some people would say election is only a corporate thing. God is, this is a, a typical Arminian view that Ar Arminian, not from Armenia with it, A-R-M-E, Armenia, no, Arminian, as from Jacob Arminius, his perspective on things. Anyway, this guy, he thought, okay, no, people are elect, but they're elect in a corporate sense. God chooses simply whoever is going to believe in Jesus. That's his choice. I choose whichever ones of you believe in Jesus. You're the elect. You're the chosen. Now, do you believe in Jesus? Then you're one of the chosen. I do think that that's a very interesting...
Calvinism would say that this election is not based on anything in you or anything about you. In fact, they would, when pressed about it, probably say that God chooses who will be saved just through the mysterious counsel of his will, not based on anything about them at all. And they say mysterious counsel, like you can't, don't even try to figure this out. It's, he just chooses. It almost sounds arbitrary. That, that's how it comes across to me. Like it's for no reason whatsoever, except for his ultimate glory, but certainly nothing about the person. Justice to the Gentiles. That Jesus is the elect one. Jesus is the, and this is where the Arminian position would be, and I'm, I'm not really exactly Calvinist or Arminianist, but, but we're, uh, we're kind of like in the middle where they're both looking at us going, you can't be there. Um, <laughs> but, but the Arminian position is going to say, Jesus is the chosen one, and God, looking through the corridors of time, sees you putting your faith in Jesus, and in Jesus, he chooses you. This sort of sees God as responding to our faith but from eternity past. That would be that perspective. Romans 8, 29, and 30 talks about predestination as it relates to us. Not just events, but, but our future. Whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. We're getting a view that this is what's happening in the salvation of individuals is something that has long ago been laid out and planned out. 
But this leads us to some questions, doesn't it? It's natural to wonder, if God selects who's going to be saved, does he select the unsaved in the same sense? And there are some Calvinists, only some, who would believe in double predestination. Or on one side they'd say predestined, pre predestination, and the other side reprobation, or the, the decision of God to pass over certain individuals, that sort of thing. The Calvinist response will back up a couple verses and read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And they'll use this to try to interpret the rest. So let me show you. Here's 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For who? All men. But then in verse 2, I'm going to be the Calvinist for a second, it names categories of men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And they would say, they would say, God doesn't want every person saved. He wants people from every category saved. And this is going to be a very common Calvinist interpretation of lots of passages. People from every category. So for kings, so God wants kings to be saved. He wants, you know, people in authority to be saved. But here's my response. I think this is an impossible interpretation of 1 Timothy. I don't, I don't think you can fairly interpret it this way because this would mean that God wants not only some people in authority to be saved, but everyone who's in authority to be saved. Let's read it again. John 2, 2, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, and or not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Not only ours, but the whole world. I mean, the, the plain-faced interpretation of this passage would be, Jesus died for everyone, <laughs> everybody, everybody, the whole world. Now, the Calvinist view, you might be able to guess, because it's similar to what we heard earlier, it's that Jesus didn't die for the whole world inclusively, but died for the whole world as in for people from every sort of community in the world. For certain individuals in all the different communities of the world. My response, that seems completely forced on the passage. It just seems fabricated in order to sustain a theology that this verse doesn't seem to support. Similar interpretations are offered a lot like that in Calvinism. So you take any, any phrase that says something, something God loves all, or everyone, or the whole world, and it always just means, you know, people from around the world, not the whole world, not everybody. 1 John 4, 14, they'll interpret this the same way. And we have seen and testified that the Father... Has
let's deal with another issue. Um, do humans really have a choice to accept or reject the gospel? Or is the Calvinist view of total depravity in the sense that, here's the view, you are so hateful against God, you are so lost, you are so dead in your sin, you're like Lazarus. And Jesus, he calls out to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out of the grave. And Lazarus, do you think Lazarus could have said no? No, of course not. Dude, you're going to do what he just told you to do. Like, you're going to come out of the grave. The thing is that Lazarus is an analogy. It's not actually a teaching. Like, this is an analogy there. You don't make arguments from analogies. Right? You come up with a teaching, and then you have an analogy to illustrate it, but you don't argue from analogies. That's like, welcome to every cult in the world argues from analogies. Talk to a Jehovah's Witness about why they don't believe the Trinity. They'll argue from an analogy. Well, I'm not my son and the father. And you're like, dude, you're not, that's not even the doctrine of the Trinity you're arguing about. And so we, we shouldn't argue from that. That's, that's not his So total depravity, irresistible grace. We talked about limited atonement, unconditional election. I don't agree with any of the doctrines completely. There's pieces of them I like, right? But, but I, I wouldn't say I'm at any point uh, Calvinist because when I get to the real nitty-gritty of the points, I go, they all really have the same point, that man has no free will in his salvation. And I don't think that that support is supported by Scripture. So, does man really have a choice to accept or reject the gospel, or is it or is Calvinism true where it's just like you just you reject it until God regenerates you and then you accept it? End of story. Um, or is it that faith comes and as a result of our faith he saves us and regenerates us? Well, Ezekiel 33:11, Ezekiel 33:11 says this. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? If you just read this casually, if you it just simplistically, it, it sounds like God is calling out to people. He's appealing to them to make a choice, to turn from their wicked ways, and then he wants to bless them, and they will live. He won't take pleasure in their death. Oh, but he will kill them. <laughs> right? This is, judgment will come, but he doesn't want it to be that way. And he lays it down into their decision making. Now make your choice. Like, behold, I set before you this day, life and death, choose whom you will serve. There seems to be choices. This is throughout the scripture. He places Adam and Eve in the garden. He tells them what he wants, and he lets them make a choice. He already knows the choice. He's already made a huge plan, factoring in all of our choices. But these are real choices. <laughs> Ik ga een trollenbier bestellen, maar je kijkt nou net als een troll. Heerlijk. Minia. Arminius huis, woordplek. Heksenwagen. Dat was de enige heksenwagen in Europa waar eerlijk gemeten werd. Gewogen. Gewogen. Ja, precies. En er was nog nooit een heks geoordeeld. Iemand onder bepaald gewicht is geen heks. Dus gelukkig maar. 
We should be able to fellowship with Calvinists. We should be able to fellowship with non-Calvinist or Arminianist. If you're a Calvinist and you can't fellowship in sweet love with non-Calvinists, there's something wrong with you. If you're an, if you're an Arminianist or, or, or a Calvary Chapelian or whatever we are, <laughs> and you cannot fellowship in sweet love with a Calvinist, something is wrong with you. These are not dividing issues. There are great issues to discuss. I like to kind of, I like to hear the best Calvinist arguments and the best Arminianist arguments and everybody, everything in between. I love to hear these things and think about them. We're really struggling to understand big issues. And there are other verses that are worth bringing up to deal with Calvinism, but this has not been a time been focused on. Let's examine all of Calvinism. But I, I wanted to take election and predestination and talk about it so that we could get these things down.